Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody for, you know, having this wonderful organization exist. I have felt very welcomed into this new town, even though I haven't really gotten to meet most of you in person. <laughs> so I just wanted to extend a thank you there. I'm excited to be sharing some music with you tonight. Um, and so I guess I'm a composer and pianist, grew up in Minnesota in a very rural kind of place, but also Minneapolis wasn't far away. So I feel like I was able to still have some culture in my life. Um, but what was the place? I lived oh, in yeah. for a long time. Cannon Falls is ah, the place Cannon I went to high school, Falls? very yes. near Northfield, like an hour oh, yeah. south of the I Tennessee. was in St. Cloud. <laughs> oh, no way. Yeah, I feel like I keep running into Minnesota people around yep. here. Yeah, the son of my dear friend teaches in Cannon Falls now. So. No way. Yeah. Small, I bet I know them. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, we'll have to talk about this afterwards. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so I, you know, grew up going to public school, started playing piano when I was four. Here comes Tito to say hello. Yeah. Um, and from there, I just sort of like went and got a music degree, realized late that I wanted to be a composer when I was a senior in college. And I realized I really liked writing music more than I liked practicing piano. <laughs> uh, there was more room for success, I guess, there. And so uh, that was easy, easy switch. And I've been writing music ever since. So... Opera, however, is very new to me in the traditional sense. Um, this is the first opera that I have attempted to write. And the name of the piece is Letters That You Will Not Get, Women's Voices from the Great War. Um, and it, like the title suggests, sets a bunch of text that Susan has sourced, Susan Werby, um, from a variety of authors from all over the world. And so originally when um, Susan and her daughter Kate Holland is the other librettist involved, uh, when they invited me to write this piece, it began actually as a song cycle and it was only nine songs. And I wrote it for a group called Opera Cowgirls and they tend to do shows in bars where they will make arrangements of various arias for ukulele and other sorts of fun country instruments hence the cowgirls theme. Um, but I knew, I knew they were capable of singing in all sorts of different ways, so I really wanted to take advantage of that. And I knew that a lot of these texts, though some of them were famous poems, some of them are actually anonymous letters or journal entries. And so I really wanted to dig into that idea that these could be anyone's voice. It could be everyday person or a very famous person. So um, I ended up writing the songs more like pop songs or folk songs, and I wanted to keep a sort of simple accompaniment, partially to stay out of the way of the voices and what the words were saying, because that's obviously the most important thing, but also in a means of just kind of exploring lots of different styles of music, because I tend to do that when I'm composing. So the first piece that I will play for you um, draws upon one of the themes that comes up a lot, uh, there are 21 songs, each of which is like a little vignette into someone's life. A few of the songs are more ensemble numbers where everyone gets to tell their part of the story, but um, most of the songs are pretty short, like two to three minute pieces. So this one is called I Sit and Sew, and I can share my... You can all stare at the score while I talk. <laughs> um, I Sit and Sew is poem written by Alice Dunbar Nelson, who is an African-American writer and activist from the Harlem Renaissance sort of era. And she is writing here about how, as a black woman, she is very much limited in the ways that she can take part in this situation. She's sort of stuck at home, can't help out her community. And the truth of the matter was that, for instance, black soldiers could not be tended to by white nurses. So it was a matter of you know, life and death for these people, whether there were enough people to help out. So her experience, I really wanted to set it as sort of like a 50s backbeat shuffle, like Fats Domino tune. And so there's a lot of like simple string parts, just playing these chords. And I really wanted to let Brianna Hunter, who is the mezzo-soprano, kind of be free with it. And you'll hear her embellishing some of these things with her singing. So without further ado... I sit and sew and just yell if you can't hear it. 
I sit and sew. A useless task it seems. My hands grow tired. My head weighed down with dreams. things I was thinking about there I was trying to leave a lot of empty space to get that feeling of just like sitting around and waiting and not being able to do anything so that's why there were all those moments where you're just like where's the downbeat (laughs) boom um yeah but I love hearing Brianna sing that because she just does an incredible job and like I said it's not traditional opera (laughs) necessarily because I don't necessarily want her to be doing the bel canto thing the whole time um And similarly, a lot of these texts are actually about women finding new roles that they play in the world and, you know, entering the workforce, becoming more independent. And also one of the themes that does come back is this idea of being stuck at home, (laughs) trying to keep the home fires burning like that's work, too. And so the next song that I'm going to play you is called Socks, and it is as it sounds like, right, is about knitting socks. But this one is written by Jessie Pope, who is a British poet, who a lot of her poetry was seen as being pro-war at the time. And I think Susan could elaborate more on this. But more recently, people have thought twice about that. Maybe it's more satirical, the things that she's saying. Um, But this particular poem is about knitting socks as a means of coping, I would say, with all the other things going on in the world. So let me figure out where my page is. 106. It's a big score. I have to jump around a little. So um, this one is totally different. I was saying stuff about um, simple accompaniments and such, but this one is in 7-4 at the beginning. It is most definitely not simple (laughs) in terms of the accompaniment. And the singer has to work hard um, in singing all these notes and rhythms. So uh, this is Sarah Beckham Turner, who's a soprano. And I got the original idea for this movement from the very first line, which is shining pins that dart and click. It has kind of that rhythm to it. And so that's where the bass line kind of comes from and the melody. So I will play that one for you now. There it is. Okay. Shining pins the dart and click in the fireside sheltered peace. Check the thoughts the cluster thick, twenty thin and then decrease. He was brave, well, so was I. Keen and merry, but his lip quivered with. 
when he said goodbye. Pour the seam stitch, pearl and slip. 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 Never used to living rough. Lots of things he got to learn. Wonder if he's warm enough. Need to catch to knit one turn. Need to catch to knit one turn. Need to catch to knit one turn. Wonder if he's fighting now. What he's done and where he's been. He'll come out on top somehow. Slip one, knit two, pearl fourteen. 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 Ta-da. So... The backup singers are the other singers in the ensemble. Occasionally, they will come in and sing backup for each other, or uh, at the very, I, in some of the songs, they're actually, they're not really in dialogue ever, but they're definitely <laughs> taking turns telling their stories. So um, that's another unique thing about this particular opera, is that the characters change characters. <laughs> they're more archetypal characters than actual human beings. So um, that was Socks. And then to change gears completely, the last one from this, this example I wanted to play for you is called The Gift of India. And this is a text written by Sarojini Naidu, who is an Indian poet and civil rights activist and women's suffragist. Um, Mahatma Gandhi called her the Nightingale of India because her poetry was so beautiful and sang the song of you know their lives. And so in this poem, she's basically pleading with the British colonial government to acknowledge India's sacrifice in the war and to grant them their independence, which of course doesn't happen until 1947, if I remember correctly. Um, so it's like a, an emotional plea that's much more serious. <laughs> and so I said it much more differently. You know, the way that I approached it was completely different. Um, and this one features primarily the low strings in the string quintet, the viola, cello, and bass. And at the end, we get a little bit of circular bowing from the violins. Um, but this one is definitely more about the singer. And singing this particular example is Angel Desai, who you might see on CBS Blue Bloods. <laughs> She's been working some network TV shows lately that are really interesting. But anyway. Uh, let me share this one with you. And W6 stands for Woman 6, which is the name of her character. And this is the Gift of India. No. flung to the east and west priceless treasures torn from my breast and yielded the sons of my stricken womb to the drum
your dauntless ranks and do honor the deeds of the deathless ones. <clears throat> Remember the blood of my martyred son. Another thing I wanted to mention about these recordings is that they were recorded this summer individually by the musicians at their house with a click track and MIDI or some piano kind of playback to listen to. So I'm impressed that it lines up as well as it does, <laughs> considering that the musicians are not responding to each other at all. Um, but I just wanted to mention that if it feels like it wasn't quite together, that's why. <laughs> um, but yeah. So that is what I was going to play you from the opera in progress. Um, there are definitely different, more melodramatic kind of scenes where people are speaking lines instead of singing them. Like I knew Angel was more of a musical theater kind of singer, so I wrote her part accordingly, um, really to explore all these different ranges of vocalization. Um, and I also had microphones in mind if you've noticed there's some quiet things that would definitely not work in a giant concert hall um so i just wanted to mention that too that i have amplification on the mind both in terms of literal amplification and in terms of amplifying these women's voices so um, that will segue me into my next kind of opera <laughs> i'm sure you if you really have a question you're dying to ask you can ask too but uh, you could also save it for the end if you would rather uh, so, the other type of opera that I'm involved in is community opera, and let's see if I can find some pictures to show you. Um, boop. This is a picture of the Tenderloin Opera Company at a, a festival called Pronk, which is short for Providence Honk Festival. Um, it's like where all these renegade marching bands show up in town and play a parade and have like a big party down by the river playing sets at the end of the night. But uh, the honk fest is a lot of fun. And we march in that parade every year. Um, this is another one from our, I can make you see it bigger. This is just a shot from one of the videos of our most recent production before the pandemic. Um, you can see this is in actually a black box theater that is built into the top of a church downtown in Providence, Rhode Island called Matthewson Street United Methodist Church. And they are the hosts for us for this whole project. Um, we have weekly meetings once a week right before the community meal. So it's really convenient for anyone who is experiencing housing insecurity or otherwise who would be there otherwise can take part. And uh, as you can see, everybody's on book, staring at their music, singing along. We often hand out scripts and music to the audience as well. If they want to take part, they can. Our motto is wrong and strong. So the idea is everybody sings all the songs together. Uh, originally, when this was started in San Francisco, these are some folks who were involved once upon a time. Um, when it first started in San Francisco, it was more like a writing exercise where people are, who are homeless will do the writing exercises. And then the playwright, Eric N., who actually was one of the founding members, and Lisa Bilava, if you all know her, uh, she was also one of the founding members. They would take that material and turn it into like <laughs> real opera, high art, where, you know, like professionals sing it and do the whole shebang. But when Eric moved to Providence, he decided, I guess we all decided just to do it as a community project. So we all sing all the songs together. And you can usually tell when people 
are singing a new song because they're not quite as loud. But <laughs> when it's one they know, they usually are pretty excited about it. And um, punchline, I'll give this to you now. This is Wendy, one of our um, fierce advocates for housing insecurity. She became homeless because her apartment had a fire and she didn't have insurance and her landlord didn't have insurance. So she was just like without a house. So that was her experience, um, how she became homeless. And so she's been as f an advocate for this. And she this is her in the Boston Globe um, talking about this affordable housing bond that just passed earlier last week. So that's exciting. I feel like this is the one art project I've been part of that I see tangible result in the world <laughs> based on what people are doing, um, which is super exciting to me. And so I'm going to play you a few of our songs and I can even show you the lead sheets that I write out um, because the idea is often we'll have random musicians show up to the show and just jump in and play along. And that's the whole point. So uh, here is the first song called Monkey Head. Monkey Head song KP After Dark. I should probably explain this a little bit. Um, monkey weed is a, a synthetic cannabinoid that's been going around in the homeless population, at least on the East Coast. And it's cheaper. I mean, I guess we don't have cannabis stores on the East Coast either. So people are trying to find what they can get. Um, and it's sort of like bath salts. It makes people crazy and act really erratically. And it can actually kill you too. And, you know, if you overdose on it. So this is monkey weed is what inspired this song. Um, and a lot of this was written by someone who is in treatment for schizophrenia. So there's a reference to Belsamra, which is, I didn't know what that was, but it's like a antipsychotic drug. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. But if I can find my link here, I'll play it back for you. And, you know, every one of these will sound different because I'm not really sure who's singing at any given time. Uh, oh, I got to find my screen. Sorry. That's not the one. Sorry. There's my Facebook. A lot of this is on Facebook, too, if you're curious. You can just look us up. Here's Monkey Head. <laughs> thing is definitely an insane clown posse reference I don't know some people are into that <laughs> in the group but I was it was new to me so that was the monkey head song and a lot of times I try to make these fun and you know at least you can catch the chorus and jump in if everything else is a mess um, so I thought I would play you another one called everybody say ah which you can tell what happens there um, this one is written about, this is from our play Island of Love, and this particular character is a homeless student who teaches surfing lessons and lives in her car and because she can't afford rent and tuition. So about surfing and like trying to figure out her life in general. <laughs> so this is 
everybody say ah. Let's play. <laughs> somebody had to say it <laughs> somebody had to say it. um so some of them are fun about like that some of them are more protest songs like uh, we wrote one about the bus system when they tried to take away the no fare or low fare pass for disabled folks and other lo low income and elderly people and it actually helped we've sang it at the state house a few times and you know enough obviously there's a lot of other advocacy going on <laughs> but I would say it helped a little bit. Um, and so, and then we also have been writing a lot of memorial songs, unfortunately, because it's a very precarious situation for a lot of these folks. And uh, whether it's overdoses or if it's, I mean, in this case, it's a horrible story of a woman most likely being murdered, but it was never investigated like that. So, um, one of our longtime members is named Diamond, and she showed up one day right after her friend was killed and just happened into Tenderloin Opera Company one Friday. And that was the first time she had been there. And uh, this whole story came up. So we decided to write letters to someone we had lost. That was the writing prompt. And this was the letter she wrote to her friend, Wendy, who had passed away. And so this is just her text verbatim. A lot of times the songs will be compilations of everybody's text kind of edited together. But this particular song is just Diamond straight up. And um, I'm going to play a recording of her introducing it. We performed this at the New Music Gathering once upon a time in Baltimore. And so we got to take a couple people down there to be in these marble halls singing songs for professional musicians. You know, like I feel like it was a really great opportunity for them to see the, the impact of the work they're doing. Um, so this is for Wendy Tallow. I'll show you the score and let Diamond take it away. Um, like I said when I was talking, <clears throat> um, I wrote this piece in there about it wasn't supposed to be a song, it was a poem. I have good people that turned this into something that, I don't, my, my thing is with this, if you're, if you're somebody in the street or if you know someone that's close to you and they're experiencing hardship, a hard time, you never know when that's going to be your last time to see them. So when I actually did write this piece, I was actually coming home from work on the bus, and she was actually hanging in a tree. And people were videotaping it, making fun of it. And I found out five minutes later that that was actually my friend. So, you know, it, it's hard, but I'm happy. I'd rather be somewhere else so somebody else can experience this. And when you hear this, don't feel bad for us out here in the street. Look at us as we're survivor, you know, or how would you how would you deal with it if you were homeless? Because I know a lot of people look at us and you're scared of them. We don't want to rob you. We don't have nothing we want. I got everything I need right now. Well, our, usual, our usual line that we say at every speaking engagement do that we do is homeless can happen to anyone. Sure can. And could you and could you survive what we do?
There was a piccolo in the background, but <laughs> thank you. Any questions? <laughs> I think both of these projects are really wonderful and very striking and different. Um, I, I was wondering if you had, with this one, the, the community-based one, uh, do you have some similar things in the works potentially in Portland? You, you moved here recently, is that right? Yeah. Um, actually, I should give credit to my husband, Jacob, who's a bass player, too. He has been working on this project with me the whole time, um, so I guess we're te a team with everybody else that's involved too. But um, yeah, we have been definitely looking into doing that. We started volunteering at Pear before the pandemic hit in hopes of getting connected with some folks there. And, you know, it's always like the community has to right. want it. <laughs> right. But, right. you know, that was our outreach step number one, was like trying to find some organizations to get to know. And mm -hmm. But yes, we would love to franchise this thing <laughs> everywhere. And then, and then real quick on the first, so the first opera is a work, is a work in progress. It's not been staged. It has yet. not. Um, probably spring 22, mm -hmm. question mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I really liked how, um, in je I mean, I like this for a lot of kind of vocal music, but especially in, in this context, I felt like the, the non-operatic sound, both of the singing technique and style and your writing seems to really fit well. And it's lovely because I can understand all the text that way without having to look at it. Uh, I was curious, when you do stage it, will you, are you planning on doing a similar thing with, with mics or amplification, kind of yep. in, intimate kind of? We're definitely gonna amplify them. And we've been talking about making it more immersive with some multimedia elements as well. I feel like there could easily be some footage you know, like actual footage from the time period. I feel like Susan can jump in if she wants to here because she's my collaborator on this. But um, the staging is a big question mark, actually, because it's such a weird piece. It's not like a narrative. So you have these little moments that happen and then the next one comes. So it might have, you know, interludes that are more like videos or I might write some extra instrumental music to connect things. Yeah, Susan, go ahead. <laughs> Well, and I think we, um, as we think about it, it, we also think about staging it very, very simply, because as Kirsten said before, these, this is not a traditional opera with characters. They're archetypes, they're mothers and lovers and munition workers. And it's been a real challenge that the singers have really met to embrace this very different way of connecting with the content. But because of that, it does give us, as, as Kirsten said, the opportunity to stage it in a, a fairly minimal way so that it is the, the content and the text and Kirsten's amazing music that, that really comes through. Yeah, I, I, I get the feeling that will work very well with that, with the music had so much uh, space in it, I guess. It's to me, I was I was wondering about it. if it were a really elaborate stage, it just wouldn't seem to fit that the music was so direct, and uh, uh, I really really enjoyed that. I mean, but it is an opera. There is an overall story arc with all these characters. There's an arc of the the war itself, I guess. Right. That's essentially the arc. Hmm. It begins in 1914. And, you know, one of the initial, the, the very first song introduces all the characters. It's called Dear Alice. Um, and the second song is about a young woman in France talking about how beautiful Normandy is before it all gets destroyed. Mm. Huh. Wow. <laughs> and then over the course of the opera, the very last song is actually a Sarah Teasdale poem, There Will mm. Come Soft Rains. And it's very famous, I'm sure. I had to actually go out of my way not to listen to anyone else's setting of it. So I wouldn't be you know be stuck or whatever but um yeah and that one is beautiful because it's basically the you know the punchline is we could all just disappear from the planet and it would continue on without us <laughs> so what are we doing here you know killing each other and and that's the last one that's the last one yeah wow and right before that one actually when people are receive news that the war is finally over that one's called finally and I decided to set that for a cappella singer. 
because I mm. wasn't sure what else to do with it. I was like, if I were getting this news, I don't know. That's what I imagine. Just one person singing out the window or something. <laughs> like, mm. um, wow. Yeah. Kirsten, can you hear me? I can. Hey, yes. I was very attracted to the way you use rhythm in your melodic ideas. Uh, so I was kind of pleased that kind of moved everything along in a nice, uh, bright, energetic, meaningful way for me. I'm very, very tuned into rhythm and how rhythm might fit with pitches and with text. So, yeah, I liked it. Thank you. You can thank Bill Bolcom for teaching me how to set text. <laughs> I was going to add that uh, speaking a little bit of rhythm, I love the way that you kind of uh, leaned into the whole mood of the the knitting um, or kind of, I guess, in a way created a musical analog for the knitting. Of course, there was the whole subtext of the mood of the of the people doing the knitting too, but um, that combination of the, you know, the seven, four and the hitting the body, the instrument, the pizzicato was, was really effective. Um, and then I thought the other, the other movement too was, was so um, effective in capturing a particular mood, the, you know, the heaviness and uh, the, um, I guess just the, the sadness, right? Um, this feeling of uh, just kind of trudging um, forward. I can't remember the adjectives you used in, in, in the music <laughs> itself, but anyway, I just thought they were both so effective at conveying these very vibrant moods. Thank you. And the musicians were fantastic. They, they were just so um, naturally uh, conformed to that rhythm, to whatever rhythm. Uh, and especially thinking that are realizing that the, the second opera was all was it also sp uh, spontaneous or was any of it planned? Uh, what do you mean by sp planned? <laughs> <laughs> it was all spontaneous. Uh, we must have had the, just lucked on on some really good musicians that that could could uh, work together, read together? Oh, well, the opera itself is being produced by the American Opera Project. So they hired a bunch of musicians. Um, some of them are actually from the original Hotel Elephant slash Opera Cowgirls song cycle production. Um, but yep, they're just a bunch of New Yorkers. <laughs> yeah, but even even that, uh, you know, you get a, a lot of musicians that are just so relaxed into falling into the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. No, I believe me, trying to get singers <laughs> to not do the vibrato or <laughs> even that part of it is hard, but um, trying to get a string player to play something jazzy is like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. 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 I run into that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Charlie. <laughs> I actually have my, uh, my six-year-old daughter here who wants to say something. Awesome. I like your music. Thank you very much, daughter. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know your name. Lena is her name. Oh, thank you so much, Lena. That means a lot. Uh -huh. Does Igor wish to say something? Is there more? Nope, hand down. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's about time. If anybody else doesn't have other questions, I'll hand it over to Mark to give his talk. If that's okay with y'all. Please feel free to reach out any, at any point, email or Facebook or whatever you want to contact me. <laughs> I'm happy to chat more. Just a quick question before you go. Are you there? Yep. What brought you out to Portland? I got a visiting assistant professor of music job at Reed College. So I'm here for at least one more year. And then I don't know, I'll scatter to the wind or whatever happens. Like my life is precarious at all times. So, <laughs> or at least my career is. So we'll see. Okay. Thanks. Yep. But thank Reed College. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Eden, shout out to Eden, one of my students who's here. <laughs> Uh, Eden Daniel. Ah, yep. welcome. Yep. Hello. Eve. Yep. Cool. Thanks for all the nice questions and for listening. Thank you. Thank you. And take it away, Mark. Thanks. Yes. Mark, you're next. Um, hi. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. 
Um, this is the first time for me, so <clears throat> please excuse my uh, uh, shoddy workmanship, you know, so <clears throat> uh, a little bit about myself. I got my undergraduate degree in piano performance and composition from Cornish Institute in Seattle, Washington. Um, Lou Harrison uh, used to, in 1979, 80, 81, he was a composer in residence there many, many times. And he taught uh, Javanese gamelan. Uh, we built our own Javanese gamelan there from aluminum with the help of Paul Drescher, and a composer from the Bay Area. <clears throat> but um, anything, you know, I learned everything from sitting in the class there with my jaw, like, oh, uh, uh, Lou Harrison is, you know, instructing everyone. And uh, I thought he was a very great composer. He has a, uh, he has a, in his music, you know, he has a, a lot of heart in his music, uh, a lot of beautiful melody. <clears throat> and, uh, I was, I thought I was just really fortunate to be able to, he was my first, you know, uh, introduction to uh, Javanese gamelan music. And uh, I'll, I'll play you one piece uh, of Javanese gamelan music and women's choir and two flutes. And <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, by the way, uh, when I was doing that piece and we were rehearsing it and recording it, and I didn't know this, you know, but um, most uh, most of the women's voices out there in the world are, are alto. You know, altos far outnumber sopranos. So uh, I I wrote it for soprano and two altos, Javanese gamelan and two flutes. And the two flutes uh, oftentimes give the pitches to the choir because you know, the, the Javanese gamelan is tuned in a, a five note scale, which is the pentatonic scale, but it's not, it's not perfectly, you know, the, the, the pitches are uneven. So um, it's not, actually it is, it's very easy for the choir to blend in with the gamelan because the ear, if you let it, will just do it automatically. But uh, the flute is in there and it, it gives the, the pitches to the choir. And at the, I got my master's degree in composition at the University of Oregon and they had a Balinese gamelan orchestra there. And that was the main reason why I went there was for gamelan. So uh, gamelan was a big part of my life uh, back, you know, way back when, back when the dinosaurs used to roam the earth. Um, but <clears throat> I wanted to start out with uh, my new woodwind quintet. I, I just finished it, I wrote it this past summer and I was really pleased with it. <clears throat> I, my first woodwind quintet I, I completed in in 2000 and so it's been 20 years and for, so for 20 years I, I've always had a hankering to write another woodland quintet and I finally got around to it. Um, <clears throat> I'm married, I have a wife, uh, two step kids, they're not kids anymore, they're 30 and they have grandchildren so uh, even though music is a really big part of my life the family and what goes on in the family is like huge, just <laughs> all encompassing. <clears throat> so I try to do the best I can um, with that. So the woodwind quintets in three movements, it's fast, slow, fast. And if you want me to, you know, I'll just quit, just let me know and get tired of it. Mm. Thank you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello. Oh, cool. Um, I'd um, I now like to dive into the gamelan music. The first piece I'm going to play for you is um, it's called the Secret Sky, and it's for Balinese gamelan and two flutes. I wrote it when I was in graduate school at the University of Oregon. I based it on a poem, which I thought was anonymous, but uh, I found out it wasn't. It might have been written by a guy named Charles Cameron, but he says that it might, might also have been written by Kabir, a 16th century Indian poet. And poem goes, I am a nightingale of the secret sky. I have watched many swans float by on the soft waves of the hidden river. I fly from one garden to the next. A rose is my mosque and my text is the grace of the marvelous giver. Before, oh, mm -hmm. before you play it, Mark. Yes. We were just wondering if you were sh like sharing your audio with the share screen thing on Zoom or just on the, in the air, just for sound for all of us. Share screen. Were, it sounded like maybe you were playing from a different computer. Was that the question? And and also, um, do do you know how, if you can screen share? I don't know if you're able to share the score. Um, um, down at the bottom of the screen, my share screen icon is in green. So I'm okay. I'm sharing. Oh, oh, okay. As far as sharing the score. Uh, I can show you the scores, like do this, you know, show it to you, but I don't know how to put it on my desk and show it to you like that. Is so, it on the same computer that you're using for Zoom? Um, oh, the score? Yeah, like do you have it in Finale or Sibelius on the same computer that you're using? I do, but it, it wouldn't do you any good because uh, the notation is, uh, Rob Keir came up with the notation and uh, it's, it's pretty good, you know, it worked. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's notation system for the Balinese Gamelon Orchestra, Slendro, the Gamelon Holy Springs, Ascent of the God of Rain. Um, okay. it's, a, it's a Slendro scale, five note scale uses each line of the staff. And then um, it's, it's different for each instrument. And let me see. I think it would, I mean, I would kind of like to see it. You kind of like to see it? Well, sure. Um, well, Am I the only one? Anyway. Um, it's, uh, if I you can open it, we can help you show it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't anticipate anybody asking me that question. Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't want to put you on the spot if you're not ready, but it would be really interesting. Um, uh, I'm totally not ready. Okay. Um, uh, it, it would, you know, it's, it's not as simple as just, you know, showing you and then you would like, oh, I get it. You know, it's, uh, 
it's uh, it's not complicated either. It's just you know something you probably haven't seen before, and um, um <clears throat> I'm sorry about that. I <clears throat> I'll show you you know the Gamelon scores for the Javanese pieces. I did pull out a piece for that. Okay. Um, anyway, the instrumentation for the Balinese gamelan is cantalon, two cantalon, two pomato, one jublog, one jugagan, uh, two rayong, uh, one kempul, and one gong, and assorted bells, like a bell tree. And um, let's see here. Here it goes. Can you hear it? Mark, uh, it's Greg Stanky. Uh, if you got your, if you turn down original sound, in in the Zoom application, and are you sharing your computer sound? Okay. Nope. I'm blasting it away on my speaker. Yeah, I can hear it now. For a while before that, it was silent. Um, do you know about the original sound setting on Zoom? Because um, you're playing it off of your room speaker, aren't you? Off my computer speaker. Right. Is it the same computer you're talking to us on Zoom with? Okay, I have an idea. If you click that green share screen button, it'll come up with a little window. And it's gonna be annoying for a second, but if you see at the top, there's an advanced tab. Yep. Click that and then just choose computer audio and hit share and it should let you let us hear your computer sound. Says to share your computer audio, please install the Zoom audio device. Oh no. Technology. Ported by a driver. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ooh, we can hear it okay right now. Thank you. 
So, um, yeah, I'd just like to let you know that uh, at the U of O, we were, uh, we were never instructed in traditional Balinese camelon. It's just like um, you're in the class and you write a piece. Everybody writes a piece and, or two. And uh, we are encouraged to think outside the box. So <clears throat> uh, I want to play another Balinese gamelan piece. Uh, this one's called uh, The Sun and the Sunflower. And it's all about how um, the relationship between the sun and the sunflower on the inside rocks. So <clears throat> oh, another thing too is uh, there is one thing that we learned, a technique called kotekan, uh, kotekan. That's where um, two uh, Balinese musicians uh, would play a interlocking rhythmic pattern or maybe even three. They play an interlocking rhythmic pattern uh, uh, made up of subdivisions of the beat. And what you get on the bottom line is a, a single, a single line, a single sounding line, but it's really two, maybe three players. In my case, it was two. And uh, I'll I'll give you a heads up when it's called Kotekan. It's very popular. Uh, technique in Balinese gamelan. Thank you. 
Hey, Mark, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, by the way, this is really fun because it's like flashback from when how I first met you because we met in the yeah. in that in that Gamelon ensemble back in ancient history. Oh, that since that piece had you said it was called Sun Sunflower. Sun in the Sunflower. Sun in the Sunflower. It has some sort of subtext to you, some sort of programmatic of feeling of some sort, I guess. Yeah, you with know a the, programmatic title like that. The sun, uh, the sunflower, it tracks the sun across the sky. It's devoted to the sun. It wakes up with the, the face of the sunflower mm -hmm. waiting for the sun to come up. And when the sun comes up, you know, bam, it goes mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and it tracks mm -hmm. it across the sky. Right. And then when the sun goes down, it goes back here and then it waits for the sun to rise again. And um, as I said earlier, you know, one might look at that as being very austere, but on the inside, and this is all a metaphor, on the inside, it rocks. The, the relationship between the sun and the sunflower. Gotcha. And, uh, I, I was wondering if in your woodwind quintet, which is, which just has an abstract title, right? It, no. Is it, no. What was it? I'm sorry. I missed it. What's it's just the, woodwind quintet. That's, that's what I mean. Yeah, it doesn't. I was wondering if it had any, to you, any sort of programmatic or a personal sort of subtext, or is it really, would you consider it really an abstract kind of piece? I, I, I hope so. Um, I, uh, uh, <clears throat> there's, I'm, I'm black and white. Basically, um, there's 
okay, if I have an agenda, you know, and I, uh, I want to come up with a cool title for the piece and there's, you know, a lot behind it, I, I can do that. But then I can also, I just, sometimes I just, I'm very happy to just, you know, just, uh, I don't write it on a paper, I do it on a computer. So I just, you know, get it out of me and then I've done my job and I can move on to the next piece. And there's that part of me. And so in the Woodwind Quintet, it, it, it expresses what it expresses. It, I hope it's, I only strive to try to make good music. So that's, that's all. I just, <clears throat> um, if I'm in the mood, like I'll, I'll give a piece of, I'll like, I'll try to come up with a cool title, but uh, um, sometimes I'm not, I'm just. <laughs> I was just wondering if it had any other, you know, kind of other images or you had some personal um, framework. I mean, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there was stuff going on and it's an expression of where you were at that time, but I was just curious if it's meant, yeah. Well, you know, uh, families aren't easy and it's, it's weird, you know, it's really weird because, you know, uh, <clears throat> whatever's going on in the family and then, and then I turn around and sit down and write this music. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, what the hell? What the hell? What's this? You know, and because <clears throat> sometimes, you know, family isn't all a bit of roses. And um, so I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I just, uh, I, I just, when I was in music school and graduate school, my teacher, not Rob Keir, uh, my teacher, uh, told me just try to come up with interesting rhythms and come up, try to come up with interesting harmonies. That's like it in a nutshell. And uh, so <clears throat> I, I just mm, do my thing. And uh, anyway, you know, uh, I'm almost out of time and I hope you guys let me just play a little bit because you've got to hear Javanese gamelan, women's choir and two flutes. It works, you know, it works. Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard too many pieces where there's gamelan and choir and it works, you know, it's something's out of tune, you know, something. Um, but uh, anyway, if for any of you that may have heard my piece performed in the Lou Harrison Celebration concert, it was called Waters of the Heart. Um, this is what the score looked like. It's called cipher notation, and it's totally a Western thing. The, the Javanese musicians, they pass it down through, you know, memory. Uh, they don't write it down. This is just Westerners coming in there and trying to, uh, you know, make heads or tails of it. Um, but this is the score, what I gave to those musicians, and they read off this. And it's on YouTube. You can, you can hear it. I... Uh, it's, it's for Slendro with an added paylog, which is, you never do that. You never do that in Gamelon music, uh, combine uh, different, well, different scales. There's two scales, paylog and Slendro. Paylog is the seven note scale. They never combine it. I, I combined one and I'm never gonna do it again. I, <clears throat> I, I don't like the result, it didn't, um, it didn't sound good to my ears, and uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I, I I used to be really into gamelan. It used to be my primary numero uno thing, and uh, a long time ago. So <clears throat> this is this is what the score looks like, and all the different instruments. There's a um, melody instruments that just play the melody. There's instruments that mark time in a cycle, like the kempool and the kanong and the katuk and the gong, the big gong. Always, it's the circle right here. It marks the end of a cycle. It's uh, Javanese gamelan is cyclical. It just repeats and repeats and repeats until the, the drummer, the guy playing the drums, uh, controls the tempo 
and when they're going to move into a new section. And um, let me see. There's two styles, the loud style, which is characteristic of Balinese music, and the soft style, which is characteristic of Javanese music. And gamelan was a part of daily life. Javanese gamelan has existed there since the third century. Balinese gamelan has existed in Bali since the ninth century. And uh, gamelan predates the Hindu Buddhist uh, culture in Indonesia. It predates it. And <clears throat> it's used for ritual ceremony, festival time, religious ceremonies, wedding ceremonies, court performances, temple performances, royal weddings, and welcoming highly respected guests at the palace. Um, Javanese gamelan is, it's a soft style and it's, they try to be very, um, intricate, intricate and soft-spoken maybe, uh, very courtly. Um, <clears throat> uh, this piece is called In Expression. It's for a full Javanese gamelan, women's choir, soprano alto alto in two flutes. Um, it's in slendro. It's, I wrote the words. Um, it's, it's about how everything is in expression for God, you know, everything is an expression of God, you know, or, every, you know, <clears throat> everyone. And, uh, that's what this piece is about in, in expression. So, and I, I you know, it, I, it's five after nine, so I'm just going to play a little bit of it. Okay. And then I'll, I'll stop. That's called the buka, the introduction. It introduces the, the melody line or the, the lumen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so it goes on for another seven minutes. <clears throat> um, uh, that piece is on this CD, and this CD is for sale at CD Baby for the physical copy and and the digital copy, and it's also for sale on iTunes. Um, so <clears throat> uh, it's uh, the gamelan writing is traditional. Uh, the choir um, just doesn't modulate. I mean. I wouldn't be stupid enough to try and modulate uh, with a Javanese gallon. No way. When there's only two rehearsals, nah. So, <clears throat> um, anyway, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Javanese music was, well, me writing gamelan music, it was used to be like a a really big part of my life a while back. <clears throat> so there you can have, if you have any questions, you know, I know you're all pretty tired, so. I'd like to comment, Mark. Um, I really like all that happens in your music. Your, your woodwind quintet, there's, there's so much happening and it's all integrated so beautifully. Uh, I when listened to it. I was trying to imagine how how you were writing it. If there was there were so many things going on at different times, it was like more than rhythmic, and and yet it just blended. And you'd have you'd have a, a sonorous uh, instrument. Um, well, there was a lot of staccato, and and it was. Um, I, it was very enjoyable to listen to. I thank you very much for sharing it. And and I just, um, the, the only words I can come up with is, is that it's just so well integrated that it, it's it's just absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. I, uh, <clears throat> I, I think a lot of uh, uh, something, you know, uh, somebody once said to me about Beethoven that, um, um, this person said that he, he Beethoven wasn't, you know, super big with melody, but he could develop anything. And so, so when I, I, when I work on a piece, I, I try, you know, to give it all my, give it my all and just go to town developing, just develop, develop, develop. And um, so, <clears throat> um, yes, it's beautiful. Do you ever, after the fact, go in and put some sounds in that uh, uh, after after it's written, then you listen to it and then go back and and and, and integrate some more sounds into it? Um, not so much, you know, these days. Uh, I I listen to it several times, just. Um, see if I can find stuff that I don't like and if I can fix it. And so I, I polish it up here and there, you know. Just, oh yeah, like we all do that, yes. But it, uh, yeah, it, it just, um, it's just a, it's just a creation that, that, that I can't think of words to really ex express it, but I really enjoyed listening to it, listening to it. Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's, one for me to do this. <laughs> I don't get much exposure. So. Well, I mean, you probably probably all heard that. <laughs> well, I don't know if any of us does, <laughs> especially these days. <laughs> um, um, uh, I. Uh, I really enjoyed doing this, and it was a pleasure to have you all in on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on making it through your first Zoom meeting, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I don't know how to, you know, do the whole score on the screen and thing. Uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, maybe next time.
I'll, I'll try to work. Yeah, on that. Mark, next time you do a presentation, uh, hit me up beforehand and we'll, we'll we can go through. Um, we can try some things out, but really what a nice presentation. I really enjoyed. Yeah. I, I really enjoy hearing the timbre of the of the gamelan. And I remember we did a we sat in with the Lewis and Clark one is one of our Monday night presentations a couple of years ago. And I really enjoyed that. I always wanted to see if I could explore that further. It's really yeah, nice yeah. to hear what you're doing. They have a beautiful gamelan. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed the counterpoint. I think the low instruments on the and the wind quintet very much. And that horn screaming out, woo! Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I uh, I barely made it through counterpoint class. Uh, um, you know, if you if you fail one class, you're out of the program. <laughs> so it was like, uh, but I I remember uh, took counterpoint for nine months, and for eight and a half months. I'd have red ticks all over my paper <laughs> that I'd turn in. Uh, just lot, lots and lots of mistakes. And <clears throat> but I, you know, the last two weeks I caught on. I, I got it. You know, it's, I understood something as um, how low on would you know try to get me a um, hundred times to understand you, you tie a long note value to a short note value you always tie a long note value to a short note value whether it's in the measure or it goes over the measure uh, because he said it maintains the um the sense of beat the pulse and you know i was like <laughs> what <laughs> Uh, but it all depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah. What sounds yeah. Like. <laughs> Those rules are for this 18th century. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember Ted Palestrina counterpoint at one, one time, dealing with those rules. Yeah, there's a lot of rules. I think it's I remember them. Very... Thank yeah. God we're changing the curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Rock and Palestrina, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what did a couple of parallel fifths ever hurt anyone oh uh you know which reminds me you know everybody heard the story about Debussy and the uh Javanese gamelan that came to the uh mm -hmm. world's fair there 1898 or wow. something yeah. and everybody's heard how he said that he liked it well you know, I read somewhere that Ravel uh, went to it too, and he said that he liked it too. Sure. And um, and then Arthur Rubinstein, the pianist. Uh, when I was young, I read both of his autobiographical books, and one of the books he talked about gamelan because he was there in Indonesia giving a concert, and and he heard gamelan and. He said that he really liked it and that it deserves to be studied and and noticed in the West. And that was like in the 1930s or 40s. So that's <clears throat> that's you know useless information, you know. <clears throat> no, not at all. No, not at all. That's I saw Arthur Rubenstein live once. I saw him once in uh, Salt Lake City. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Well. <clears throat> was he at his prime or was he like struggling as an old guy? He was a, still playing. <laughs> he was an old guy, but he put on a great concert. Still yeah. He, it? That's his nocturnes were his, uh, were the best, his, his later, his last ones. In fact, he used, uh, I have I have those, and on the on the jacket uh, it says that the the first recording of his of him playing the Chopin Nocturne should be rounded up and thrown out. The second one maybe there were two that you could save. The third one maybe a few more. He says I think I got it this time, <laughs> and <laughs> it, it, it's really beautiful. The, the last thing. I saw Ray Charles play before he died. And oh, he still had it. <laughs> Just barely, but he still had it. Yeah. 
Um, twice. Me too. <laughs> Great both times. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I'm impressed when people can still bring the show. You know, I will never make it that far. <laughs> if anybody watched the PBS fundraisers, we, we watched one that uh, was the last internet before on folk music. Mm -hmm. And and the and the old guys on <laughs> there were they still had it from the 60s and the 70s. I, I'm surprised they were still alive, but they, they they could really rock out. When Dolly sang her vaccine thing, I was like, whoa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at that yeah. vocal facility. Who <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but anyway. So we got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Only getting better all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. We're all supposed to live longer. I think I need to go find some dinner, but yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks, yeah. Kirsten and Mark for us, uh, both yeah. of, uh, fantastic presentations. Thanks to you both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. How do I quit? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've oh, yeah, the there's button. a big red button on the bottom big red right. end button on the lower right oh, you're all, all in the meeting for everybody oh, <laughs> so. oh. yeah. all right oh. thanks everyone uh see you thank see you bye-bye